Hello. If you can get, I'll get seated. And that'll be great. Um, welcome, everybody who are here today. We are glad you're here on this sunny Sunday morning to worship God. We have the communion cups in the back, so grab one before we start, if you can. Uh, we have cards in the seats back in front of you to write your praises and prayers down. And put them in the collection tray in the back by the communion cups. Mm, please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for this day, and thank you for everything you've given us. And thank you that we get a gather here today and worship you. And please be with everybody who are not here for whatever reason, if they're sick or traveling, be with them. Please be with everybody who who are affected by this virus, uh, financially or physically, be with them and keep us safe and help this worship to go well and be pleasing to you. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Jack. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter. I will not faint. He is my shepherd. I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not waver, walking by faith. He will be strong to deliver me safe. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. We will glorify. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is a great I am.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. My precious, precious church family. God loves us so much. He has given us the ability to get up this morning, to move around, to enjoy what we have enjoyed, to see the beauty that he has given us. I think it was Friday night. I looked over to the west as the sun was setting. I could not see it. There was building in a way. But I could see the clouds and the beautiful orange glow on those clouds in a way I hadn't seen quite like that before. It was beautiful. And God, I thank you. And this is the time that we have set aside to tender back to God a small portion of that we have been given. He's given each and every one of us a talent to use. So I'm a multi-talented and bless them for their efforts. But what they were giving back in the Old Testament was a huge amount compared to what we are asked to give now. God only asks that we give as we have been prospered, remembering that there are several facets the way these funds are used, and they're all used to glorify the name of our Lord and Savior. Will you bow with me? Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for his sacrifice, for your love for us, your forgiveness, your amazing grace, your ability to Take our sins when we tend them, give them to you and throw them as far as the east is from the west. Father, as we tender back a portion unto you, we pray that these things will help keep this church afloat and expanding your will and enlightening people that we are here to help and to serve. Watch over us and guide us, Father. Forgive us and keep us strong in our faith. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Craig. God is the fountain winds. God is the fountain winds. Ten thousand blessings flow. To him my life, my health and friends, and every good I owe. The comforts he affords are neither few nor small. He the source of fresh delights, my portion and my all. He fills my heart with joy, my lips attuned for praise, and to
tonight. Uh, normally we have our children's Bible hour right now, but today we do not have any that I can see. So we do have a scripture reading before the sermon. David Perry, our guest speaker today. And uh, Jack, if you'll make your way up, we'll, um, you'll read the scripture before the message. Today's reading for the sermon will be Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans who were, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too with, will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower asylum fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Good morning, and I've said that already to somebody that said good morning too. Thank you, Jackson, for reading and introducing the lesson. And uh, I'm not going to really begin there at what the Lord says uh, at his sermon. Uh, I will get to that in just a few minutes. But um, the lesson, I would have to... <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> you know, ever since I was a schoolboy, I've always had a fascination about the Titanic. Maybe you've heard the story about the RMS Titanic. In fact, I became fascinated with that story about the Titanic, watching an old program. In fact, I found it uh, and recorded it on our VHR. And so I watched it with Ginger, uh, the time tunnel. And two of the time tunnelers went back in time to that event that took place in 1912, to April 14th, uh, a few days before. And they tried to prevent the tragedy that would occur. And of course they couldn't, and they got transported through time to another event. And on the story goes with the time travel. Well, like I said, I've always been fascinated about the story of the Titanic. And I think, I, I think most of you have stood or understood that story. And it's more than just a story. It's a disaster. It's history. And this lesson is about that. It's called Lessons from the Titanic. Um, I think there's always a lesson. And I think the Lord has an amazing ability to get us to stop and to reflect. You know, there's always a lesson in the calamity of others. You know, we have a tendency to think that bad things only happen to bad people. Other, other people, uh, it doesn't really happen to me, you know. Uh, we go through our lives and experiencing good things, we hope. But there is always a lesson in a calamity of others. It should cause us to awaken to a sense of, it's the unending of the world. I mean, the ending of the world. And the unexpected that might happen to us. We don't expect that bad things to happen to us. Well, this last week, uh, I was driving Ginger's car and I came to what I was a curve in the road. I hit the brake, no brake. I went, oh boy. And I grabbed the emergency brake, pressed the button, and I went to the turn and I came to the stop sign. I tested it. No brake. Well, I drove home. Well, <laughs> I was glad that Ginger wasn't driving. <laughs> but I used the emergency brake. And a, and a calamity, if I didn't know any better, could have happened. I could have plowed into somebody or I could have flipped over to some whatever, some other uh, thing. You know, I used to enjoy flying. Uh, until they started 
crashing into the sea, 737, 777, you know, the motor of uh, the engine catches on fire. You saw it on the news. I used to enjoy flying places. I've been to foreign countries in flight. I've been across country back and forth. I used to enjoy them before they started crashing. Well, you know, I wonder sometimes uh, why hasn't something like that happened to me? Uh, the Lord is take, talking, um, and I'm going to turn back to that passage uh, in Luke 13, chapter 3. Uh, and I'll, uh, thank you, Jackson, for reading it. But there were some at that season that told Jesus of what happened. And I think they knew that what had happened. Uh, and they said, you know, some people were worshiping God and pilot soldiers ran in there and mingled their blood with the blood of the sacrifice. They killed people. I don't know how many people killed, were killed. And Jesus said, answering them, suppose you that these were, these Galileans suffered these things because they were extraordinary uh, sinners? I tell you, no. He said, no. I tell you, no, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And he continues his sermon. We call that was, you know, that would be some kind of uh, anarchist that would do that, such a thing. Uh, a man-made tragedy, so to speak. A terrorism, we might call it. He says, or upon those 18 whom the Tower of Siloam fell, 18 people perished. You think that they were extraordinary sinners because those things happened to them? No. I tell you no, except you repent. He repeats the verse. I tell you no, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. But it doesn't matter if it's a man-made tragedy. It doesn't matter if it's a natural tragedy. I suppose that that tower fell and killed 18 people because of an earthquake or something like that. I don't think a rocket or an airplane plowed into it <laughs> like the 9-11. Uh, but some kind of tragedy took place and 18 people. You know, Jesus said, I tell you no, except you repent. You shall all likewise perish. I think when he prophesied that statement, that statement happens every single day. Day. I cannot turn on the TV and uh, watch the news channel without hearing about some kind of tragedy or some kind of event where somebody has taken the life of somebody else. You know, we turn on the news for Seattle, whatever, around the world, whatever. All these kinds of things happen. And there's a lesson. James says it's the ending, I think, the ending of the world or the, just the brevity of life. What is your life, even a vapor, if you know not, uh, uh, even a vapor that appeared for a little time and then vanishes away? And it is appointed that a man wants to die, but after this, the judgment, Paul said in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You know, Jesus repeated that statement twice. Preachers uh, sometimes do that, repeat. <laughs> A verse of scripture twice. And for a little time today, I want to reflect about the sinking of the Titanic. What are the lessons to be learned from such an event? Like I said, I've always had a fascination with it. Uh, I remember when they found the Titanic. Uh, I think it was about 1987, 88, 89. Uh, they found the Titanic and, and it was in the National Geographic. And I, I read the whole article and I looked the pictures off the page, you know, uh, I, I couldn't believe it. So much so I had a fascination that one sister in the church bought me a book about the Titanic. There was pictures and there was a story told and I read it from cover to cover and digested it. And after that digestion, I went, wow, there's a lesson there, I, and I wrote this lesson. I derived a lesson from that book. Well, in 1912, a period of great optimism prevailed. Men, people were living longer. Um, a period of prosperity had developed. 
uh, bigger and better inventions, discovery, science and industry and technology was rapidly advancing. And they're still continuing to advance. And there was a period of great prosperity. Wealth had to become a god for people to worship. And in the past hundred years, modern inventions and health, uh, marvels of man's mastery over the inner universe. And in 1912, if there was one industrial achievement that seemed to take center stage, it was the production of the RMS Titanic. Think about that name, Titanic. It seems to suggest something that's huge, gigantic, Titanic, bigger than life itself. And the pedestal upon which she was placed was unsinkable because of her 16 watertight doors or watertight compartments, she was considered unsinkable. One seaman arrogantly proclaimed that God himself could not sink her. It was a seaman that proclaimed or stated that fact. Titanic, think about this, was 882 feet long. She was 175 feet high. She was 92 feet wide. She weighed 46,000 tons, more than that, actually. And she displaced 66,000 tons of water. That's the reason why she could float, <laughs> because she displaced uh, more water than she weighed. She had 30,000 horsepower. Now, that's where I get <laughs> the brain going. 30,000 horsepower. I don't know the capability of her speed, but she was considered the epitome of safety. I mean, all this watertight integrity was for safety. Style, you looked at her, she was a beautiful vessel. Why did I use the word she <laughs> to describe Titanic? Ships have always been called she. She was a beautiful ship, a luxury liner. And for this, no expense was spared. Luxury. She was a floating palace. First class staterooms, swimming pools, jacuzzis, tennis courts, gymnasiums, ballrooms, elevators, a floating palace, you name it. She had it. Well, on a cold Sunday night at 11.40 p.m., April 14, 1912, Titanic collided with an Atlantic iceberg on her starboard side. Starboard side. If we're facing forward. <laughs> well, it wasn't long for the ship's engineer to mathematically conclude that Titanic will sink. God himself could not sink her. Well, yes, God himself could sink her. That night, there were 2,228 souls aboard, but only 705 people would live to see a new day dawn. That night, 1,523 people perished. Men, women, children. They perished. They lost their life. What are the lessons to be learned from an event such as that? Well, number one, from Titanic's disaster, we should learn to put our trust in God. You know, when you watch a movie like Titanic, um, I am referencing a, a, a Titanic movie there. It, it sort of portrays that a lot of wealthy millionaires, well, they were quite, quite a handful. There were just a handful of them. It was mostly filled with people that were just ordinary people. Uh, they were down in steerage, maybe second class, but they weren't necessarily first class uh, in that order. Well, in James says, 
Verse 13 of James, the fourth chapter, go to now ye that say that tomorrow we will go to such a city and continue there and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what you shall be on tomorrow. For what is your life, even a vapor that appear for a little time and then vanishes away? For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we will live and do this or that. He said, you think about this. Uh, go, you know, think about this. You that say today we'll go to such a city, buy and sell and get gain. That's, you know, that's capitalism. There's nothing wrong with capitalism. But we ought to say, if the Lord wills, I'll do this or do that. You know, there's a TV show that still exists. Who wants to be a millionaire? <laughs> a lot of people want to be a millionaire. And back then, a lot of people were millionaires. I don't know if they were billionaires then. But a lot of people just that boarded Titanic envision a land of opportunity, sort of flowing with milk and honey, so to speak. Well, just like today, people were trusting in wealth. People were trusting in riches. People were trusting in an almighty dollar. But the almighty dollar could buy rather than an almighty God. You know what the problem is with Americans? We don't think we're rich. I mean, you know, Bill Gates, he's rich. Uh, Donald Trump, he's rich. Jeff Bezos, he's, you know, I could go on. They're rich. Uh, me? <laughs> I'm not rich. But did you know Americans own 40% of the world's silver? We own 40% of the world's railroads. We own 50% of the world's gold. We use... 50% of the world's electricity. We use 50% of the world's steel. We own 60% of the world's copper. We use, and I think some of these statistics have gone up, 66% of the world's oil. And we use 85% of the world's automobiles all for 6% of the world's population. Gives you a new perspective. We don't think we're rich, but compared to people around the world who don't live like we do, we are, we are rich. I hope we're rich toward God. You know, God <laughs> has never condemned someone for being rich. In fact, you can go back to the Old Testament and read it. You can read about Abraham, Isaac, David, uh, Solomon. They were rich. God blessed them because, of, uh, because they had riches. They were because they were blessed. God gave them richly all these things, you know. Uh, but God in his wisdom has given a clear-cut warning. Paul said, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, not to be arrogant about our riches or our blessings, who gives us richly, not trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Well, the, it's clear what this verse means. Trust in God. Put your trust in God rather than riches. We are rich to many people compared around the world. 6% of the world's population and we own 85% of the world's automobiles. If you drove here today, that makes you a rich person. We don't think of it that way, but we are. Uh, we should never be so bold as to think that, well, it's in my own hands. I can do this or that. I can go there. I can do this. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm driving. I'm in the driver's seat. And, uh, you know, wealth and prosperity, it's in my own hands. Put your trust in God rather than in your riches. 
Every good gift and every perfect gift, James says in James, the first chapter, verse 17, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. When you and I own something, it's because God has blessed us with that. That thing we drive, the house we live in, or whatever we have, our blessings, every good gift comes from God. Amen? Yes. Thank you. Let, we should never <laughs> be so high-minded and, uh, and remember the words of Jesus when he said, He that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. That was one quarter of the field. The seed fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. It's the deceitfulness of riches. Wealth is a deceiver. Money is a deceiver. People say, well, money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And then, like today, people put their trust in wealth, in prosperity, in other things of this world, rather than a living God. Make no mistake. Many people have gone down the road of deceit and deception because of the value of money, what you can buy. You know, people think if I could just win the lottery, my life would be perfect, you know? People, thousands of people flock to the state of Nevada just to win, get lucky at the casino. Well, we have casinos here. People flock to these things just for the sake of getting rich. The truth is many people's lives have been ruined by con otters, by people gambling away uh, all that they have saved or even borrowing their way into poverty. Unfortunately, when people have riches, many times they put their trust in their riches and they believe that they begin to think they don't need God. Everything that they need can be bought with an almighty dollar rather than the almighty God. Folks, we can realize, we should realize that we can have money, but not put our trust in money. Charge them that are rich, that they be not high-minded, the apostle Paul said. And in fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, the same chapter, verse 6, that passage, if you can read that, he says, put your emphasis on godliness, not goldiness, not the gold, not the riches, but in the living God who gives us richly toward God. Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. Solomon's father, David, said this in Psalms chapter 18, verse 30, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried, and he is a buckler, a shield, unto all them that trust him. You know, I've looked it up. There are over 165 verses of scripture that says or deals out or measures out putting your trust in God. 165 verses in the Bible, old and new. In God we trust, says so right there on the dollar bill. But for many people, sadly, it's not true. Well, brothers, sisters, friends today, if our lives and our trust are not anchored in God the Father and Jesus Christ and God's holy word, we, just like the Titanic, will sink. Number two, the second lesson we can learn from Titanic's disaster. We can learn to serve the needs of others. You know, that night, that fateful night, there were some real heroes on board that ship. The Marconi radio operators, uh, they were taking charge of the wireless. They stayed at their post. Um, the first officers, the crewmen, loaded 
women and children first on the lifeboats. The, the husbands, the men stood by watching. Men below deck stayed at their posts, you know, knowing that they were going to die. Because Titanic was going to sink. That night, there were some real heroes. And so, let me ask you a poignant question. Would you die so that somebody else could live? Would you die so that somebody else could live? That's what the Lord did. He died so that we could live. Would you die so that somebody else could live? James said, and uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, verse 27, Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. For as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Ever wonder why the elders do what they do? Thank you, Rodney, uh, Brother Rodney. Thank you, Jim. Jim, the Jims. Thank you, Ken Hubs. Thank you, brother. I've forgotten your name, Dad. <laughs> I, I haven't. <laughs> well, you know, Paul said this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What happened to Jesus when he was crucified? What happened to Jesus when he was crucified? He died? He died. Well, what happened to Paul when he was crucified with Christ? He died too, but his life didn't end. He said, and yet I live. I'm crucified with Christ, and yet I live live and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by the faith of the son of god who gave himself for me you know paul is an he said i'm a dead man yet i'm walking i'm crucified with christ galatians chapter 6 verse 14 but god forbid that i should glory except in this cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You know, Paul preached more gospel sermons. Paul converted more people, established more congregations, um, mo wrote more epistles or letters to the churches than anyone. How'd you do it, Paul? How did you do that, accomplish that in your life? I'm not the Apostle Paul. I can't answer his direct question. But I think he would say, I didn't do it. It was Christ that lives in me. And so I repeat my question. Would you die someone that someone else could live? You know, we looked at Philippians, and I want to turn to Philippians <clears throat> Philippians, the second chapter. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other, others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind or attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but was uh, made of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's what he did so that we might live. I'm going to ask this question. Verse 7, have you been made in the form of a servant? Do you serve? the needs of others. We should be. There's an old song. I think it's in the sacred selections. Have you lifted a stone from your brother's way? 
struggles along life's road? Have you lovingly touched some torn, worn hand, shared with someone his heavy load? Oh, the things we may do, you and I, you and I. Oh, the love that we can give if we try. Just a word or a song as we're passing along, they will count in the great by and by. Number three, we learn from Titanic's I want to ask you this question. Have you been found in the form as a servant? Have you become a servant that others could be saved? And number three, from Titanic's disaster, we should heed. There's only three. That There's more, actually. Uh, from Titanic's disaster, we should heed, be, learn about heeding the warnings to meet God. On Sunday night, April 14, 1912, Titanic was warned seven times about the approaching icebergs. I'm not going to go into the mathematical about seven. <laughs> That's another analogy. But seven times she was warned. The sixth warning came at 2.40 p.m., two, four hours before the inevitable collision was going to happen. The message read, much heavy packed ice, great number of icebergs. At 11.05, just 35 minutes before the collision, the SS Californian sent this message. Say, old man, we're stopped, surrounded by icebergs. Well, Titanic's operator, Mike Carney, wireless, sent back this message. Shut up, shut up, I'm busy. And never gave the captain the message. <laughs> Can you imagine that? At 11.30 p.m., 10 minutes before the collision at 11.40, <laughs> the wireless operator on the SS Californian shut off the wireless and went to bed <laughs> and went to bed. A double tragedy. Because the SS California was right there on the horizon. The two ships could actually see each other. When I read that in that book, I thought of the scripture of Acts chapter 17, verse 24. <laughs> if if happily we might feel after him. Though he be not far from every one of us, the Lord is very near. He's very near. And yet, for many people, so very far away. You know, the SS California could have been a thousand miles away. They couldn't have helped with that wireless turn off. They didn't know what was happening over there when the Titanic was sinking. I mean, they sent out, we're sinking, we're sinking. They couldn't hear it. And so I wonder today, the Lord is here. Don't let him turn off the wireless. Keep in touch with the Lord. He's so very close to every one of us. You know, sadly today, people laugh about religion. Religion? Christianity? That's for old people wanting to get to heaven. It's just for little children, you know. And they apathetically laugh it off. Hmm. You know, Paul asks a very poignant question. In Hebrews chapter 2, how shall we neglect? Sorry. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How are we going to escape? There's a tragedy that's going to happen. Someday, the world will be destroyed. The Lord is going to come. And we who are Christians, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The people of the world are going to perish. We could too. If we neglect so great a salvation, the lesson is heed the warnings 
while we have time to stop. It's all Titanic had to do was just stop or change course, plot a new direction toward salvation for eternity. You know, folks, what's so amazing, frustrating maybe, why didn't they listen to the warnings? They were told warnings seven times. Why, why didn't they just listen and stop? Can you imagine how many times the captain, the first officers must have said, why didn't we just listen? In the two hours and 40 minutes they had left to live. But the truth is, we won't have just two hours and 40 minutes to regret. If we neglect so great a salvation, we're going to regret, regret for eternity. And that never ends. On April 14, 1912, Titanic had 2,228 people aboard, but lifeboats for only 1,178 people. Speaking in plain terms, Titanic was not prepared for disaster. As 200, sorry, 2,228 people boarded Titanic, death may have been the last thing on their mind. They weren't thinking about dead. This ship is unsinkable. We can set a course, get to America. Death, we're not worried about that. Are you prepared for death? I'm not talking morbid fix fixations. But are you prepared for the Lord's return? A trumpet will sound and the dead shall arise. And we that are living We'll meet the Lord in the skies. Meet them together. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Are you ready for that day? That's what's important. It's important. You know, sadly, millions of people today are not prepared for eternity. Careless soul, why will you linger, wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation or warning? Oh, prepare to meet thy God. Well, lastly, this morning, in conclusion, what are the lessons from Titanic? Number one, we need to trust God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. When you talk about God, and when you talk about impossibility, I mean, there's stark contrast. There's nothing's impossible with God. But without faith, Paul says, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Two things. Do you believe in the existence of God? Do you believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him? I hope that you can say amen to that. Believe that he is. Put your trust in God. Number two, we need to serve the needs of others. Would you die? so that somebody else can live, die to yourself, that is. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 19, but though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself the servant to all that I might gain the more. Have you been found in the form of a servant? I hope you have. And number three, we need to heed God's warnings. There's a warning up ahead. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. For we know him who has said, Vengeance belongeth to me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, only 705 people were saved that fateful night of April 14, 1912. There are were lifeboats for 1,178 people. 
2,228 people, room in the lifeboats for 1,178 more people, simple arithmetic, and that's all I'm capable of, uh, simple arithmetic, uh, 473 more people could have been saved. More, they could have crammed the lifeboat. But the truth was, people didn't believe that the ship was sinking until it was too late. They didn't want to get in that lifeboat. You know, I'm on this big ship. You want me to get that little dinky boat and go out there in the ocean? No, no way. They didn't believe the, so, uh, the ship was sinking until it was too late. You know, I've thought about this a lot. This old earth that we live in, on. It's Titanic. And people are out there living their lives as if this old earth will never be destroyed. It'll never sink. They just could care less about God and Jesus Christ, the son, and God's own holy word. I was standing on the banks of the river, looking out over life's troubled sea. When I saw an old ship that was sailing, is that the old ship of Zion I see? His hull was bent and battered. From the storms of life I could see, the waves were rough. But that old ship was sailing. Is that the old ship of Zion I see? At the stern of the ship was the captain. I could hear as he called out my name. Get on board. It's the old ship of Zion. It will never pass this way again. As I step on board, I'll be leaving all my trials and troubles behind. I'll be saved with Jesus, the captain, sailing out on the old ship of Zion. You know, more people could have been saved that night if more people would have stepped into a lifeboat. <laughs> because there's only ever been one unsinkable ship. It's the old ship of Zion. It's the Lord's ship. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you how to get on board. There's only one gangplank. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Jesus said, I tell you no, but except you repent. You will all likewise perish. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father in heaven. We can repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the gangplank to get on board the old ship Zion called the Lord's Church. Step on board. If you've not obeyed the gospel, you can. We're going to sing an invitation song. You can come forward and ask for, uh, to, for baptism. And one last lesson. Preacher usually has one last scripture. First Timothy chapter 1, 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away faith, have made shipwreck. Perhaps today you've put away faith, maybe a good conscience. You're out there stealing, uh, uh, steering your vessel and you're going in off directions. Lives can be saved from a shipwreck. If you don't delay, there's only a window, a little bit of time. There's a shipwreck. It's going to sink. Lives can be pulled off and out of that shipwreck. I hope you don't think my lesson was a disaster. <laughs> the only disaster would be if we ne neglected so great a salvation. Won't you come while we stand and sing? My Jesus knows when I am lonely. 
He knows each pain, he sees each tear, he understands each lonely heartache, he understands because he cares. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. My Jesus knows when I am burdened, he knows how much my heart can bear. He lifts me up when I am sinking and brings me joy beyond compare. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. When other friends seem to forget me, when skies are dark, when hope is gone, by faith I feel his arms about me and hear him say, you're not alone. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. Amen. Our song before we take the Lord's Supper, how deep the Father's love. <clears throat> Amen. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which mar the chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot. 
not give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Amen. Please be seated. Hope you all have your cups ready. Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, Mount Sinai, a mountain covered in smoke, a mountain that people couldn't touch. The people lived in fear so that God would strike them. But right after that, after he, God explained the Ten Commandments in the next few chapters and some of the other things he wanted them to do, in chapter 24, there's an odd scene. Moses and Aaron, in verse chapter 24, 9, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, his, Aaron's sons, and 70 of the elders went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stones, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on these men of the people, these elders, chiefs of the, of the people of Israel. There they beheld God and ate and drank in his presence. I think that's interesting thought how God, who though he has to be on the mountain and respected and can't be touched because of our sin, how we can't touch him, we can't look upon him because he's so holy, he still wanted to be with us. When we get to uh, Luke chapter 22, I think I better read it off my, off my Bible here. Luke chapter 22, 15. And when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, when the hour came, whoops, it's a little off. When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Just as God wanted to be with the people of Israel and wanted to show his love, just as he, just as God was walked with Adam in the garden, as he was served by, as the angels and God were served by Abraham in the, in the, in the desert. Um, so Jesus wants to, Jesus wants to be with us. And his main goal is to be with us in heaven. But we have this time now where we can be with him 
and we can be in God's presence as he is on the throne. We can think of, of him and know that he's with us. Let's give thanks for this meal we share with him. Dear Father, we thank you for this bread, which remind us, reminds us of your son's body on the cross, which is the proclamation of your love for us. The fact that you want to be with us so much that you would sacrifice your son, that he would sacrifice his self for us. Thank you, Father, that you've removed our sins. And we ask that you, as we partake of this, that we be reminded of the body that he purchased in this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome God, we come before you again, thanking you for this privilege to share with you in this meal. We thank you, Father, for the blood of your Son, which washed away our sins, which is symbolized in this cup. Help us, Father, to truly remember that as you died, on that cross for us. And so should we also die to sin and live for Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Walking in the light. It begins with the sopranos and then the altos join in and then the rest of us. We are walking in the light. If we are walking in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we are willing to confess our own unrighteousness, he will wash away all our transgressions. If we are walking in the light, 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we are willing to confess our own unrighteousness, he will wash away all our transgressions. We have fellowship with one another. Family, what a great lesson. David, thank you. The thing to remember is that we still have the equivalent of all those life, or life rafts, life preservers still open. Who are we flinging that life ring to? Let's be throwing it out there. We, we know that there are people who still need the good news. Uh, they may not realize it and they may not capitalize on it. But won't be ashamed to get to heaven and hear our captain say, man, could have filled up a couple more. Let's, let's do our part. We, um, we have lots going on today. I so appreciate Miss Jody and her ability to get so much information, such a, a little bit of paper. Take a couple minutes, look through the prayer requests, see who's hurting and who needs prayers. Look at what the activities are going on. We've got LTC going today. We're, we're 40 days away. Uh, 40 days is kind of a big biblical number. Let's, let's hope it turns out okay for the kids. Um, lots going on. Uh, there's, a, there's an elders meeting tomorrow night. If you've got something on your heart, we're going to be here at 6. We can spend time praying. We can spend time talking. You can tell us what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Um, we're open to both. Um, lots, of, lots of new information uh, in the bulletin as well. Jim Hargrove got a new uh, phone number. And Jody corrected the, the incorrect number that I had in the bulletin for Gilbert, um, which got me thinking. We had an advisory team meeting the other day, yesterday, and Jim challenged us all to think about who you haven't seen in a while or who you haven't heard from. Either you reach out to them or make a note and let one of us know, and we'll reach out to them. Let's, Gilbert's, Gilbert's the one that got me thinking about that. I talked to him the other day. Um, He's always up for a discussion. Just be ready to help him carry it along. Um, just let's, let's be reaching out and looking for those opportunities. Another opportunity is right out here on the shelves out in the hallway. Uh, lots of blessing bags are ready to go. We need some more supplies. Um, so if you're at the store and you think of it and you see the, the cocktail weenies or the spam or whatever, grab it. Remember, it has to be edible for somebody who doesn't have a kitchen. Think, think portable and on the go. Um, just we let's be passing those out and, and reaching out to those who need who need the Lord, who need fed. Um, prayer requests, like I said, there's a there's a good list here in the uh, bulletin. There's lots that we'll discuss tonight at five when we meet online. We meet every Sunday night for prayer. Uh, turns out usually into some good fellowship too. Uh, thank you all for your prayers for Isabella. She's doing much better. She was she was hurting this morning, so she and Carrie stayed home. But very much appreciate the prayers for that little girl. Um, we're going to close in in just a minute with prayer. We're going to do our congregational scripture, and we're going to have some family reunion time. Let's use it. Don't uh, there's nothing that says we have to be out of here in any certain time. The kids are going to be spending getting set up for LTC, but let's. Let's fellowship. If there's something on your heart, if you need some encouragement, if you just need people, we're here. So let's, uh, let's pray together, family. Our Father God, we know that you are big. We know that you are beyond what we can understand and see, but we have the faith in you. Lord, we, we ask that you would strengthen us to be consistent in, in pursuing you but also, Lord God, that we will share your hope, your gospel with those that we, that we come in contact with, whether or not they're willing to hear it. Lord, give us the wisdom to keep, to keep telling the story. Lord, we ask that you would be with us, that you would give us eyes to see 
where we can do your work. Father, we ask that you be with those that are hurting, those who are not here for whatever reason, those who are sick, those who are, are struggling. Lord, there's so many challenges in the world that we, we just don't even understand that people are going through. We ask, Lord, that you would be with those who are teaching and preaching in your name, who are in the mission field. Father, help us remember that we're all missionaries for you right where we're at. Lord, we ask that you would bless our children, that you would strengthen them as they learn and prepare to participate in the LTC events, that you would give them the strength to build that foundation for a lifetime in your service. Lord, their children will grow and become our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we will work constantly for you. Lord, we ask that you would keep us physically safe this week, that we would that we would be mindful of how blessed we are. We thank you for all these things in your son's name. Amen. Okay, new month, new scripture, 1 John verse, or chapter 4, verse 12, if you'll repeat after me. If we love one another, God remains in us. And his love is perfected in us. Isn't that true? All right, family, let's uh, let's spend some time fellowshipping.